I, I believe that empathy towards Palestine or Palest the Palestinian cause across America and the West had somewhat increased steadily over the last 20 years. And I feel like the actions of the last three or four days have totally reversed that. The Palestinians, I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for the Palestinians. I have, do not have a lot of sympathy for the Palestinian leadership. Fareed, where does this podcast find you? I am in New York, um, in actually my, my bedroom, which has good light. And so I, I wasn't sure whether this was a video thing, but um, here I am. Well, the, I'm sure the light will come through on the podcast. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Nice. And also just thank you. I can't imagine there must be, there's probably two or three people in the world right now that are more in demand than you. I don't know who they are, but I appreciate you carving out the time for us. So give us the atmospherics here around or some context for what happened in Israel and why now and what you think the objectives and the end state goals are for Hamas? It's a great question. So I think, you know, if you want to, if you want to think about it in a kind of historical backdrop, really the most important thing that has happened over the last two decades in the Middle East is the withdrawal of American power, you know, in a fairly dramatic sense. The United States had been the kind of dominating outside force in the Middle East for decades. It used to be the Soviet Union and the United States both had their client states. Then in a kind of amazing move of, ju of diplomatic jujitsu after the 1973 war, Kissinger gets Egypt to flip. It goes from being pro-Soviet to pro-American. And that begins the end of the Soviet era and or the bipolar era, and it becomes a period of American domination. So the United States had better relations, if you think about it, in 1975 with every country in the Middle East than they had with each other. This was sort of Bismarck's dream in the 19th century in Europe to be the pivot. So the United States had better relations with the Shah of Iran, with, the, with Egypt, with uh, you know Syria, with all these countries. Uh, and of course, it had very close relations with Israel. Then, you know, then that starts to to change. But the fundamental thing that happens after the war in in uh, Iraq is that the United States realizes it is overinvested in the Middle East. It just does not have the capacity. It's a very turbulent, unstable uh, region, and the only way, seemingly, to stabilize it is military power, military force. And Obama begins this. It was you call it pivot to Asia, but really was a pivot away from the Middle East. And he was continuing in a way something that Bush had begun in the second term, chastened by the Iraq adventure. Bush had been cutting back. And so in that context, what's been happening is you've been creating a kind of post-American Middle East. And in that Middle East, everyone is jockeying for advantage. And everyone is trying to figure out, how do I protect my equities? How do I... So the Turks have become much more active and... and, and uh, you know, freelancing, the Saudis and the Iranians, that's the principal dynamic. Each one is trying to become the top dog. Uh, Israel has quietly become the essentially economic superpower, technological superpower of the region, but in increasingly military. And the Israelis have been trying to do this extraordinary move, which is to completely marginalize the Palestinians by making peace with the Arabs, who want to make peace with Israel because they fear a common enemy, Iran. So that's the backdrop of what's happening. Two, two important uh, things in the shorter term. One is Netanyahu really pushing forward to try to make a deal with Saudi Arabia, which would really marginalize the Palestinians, because Saudi Arabia the, the, is the most important Islamic state. You know, it's the richest, it's the one with the, the, the two great mosques. King of Saudi Arabia is called the custodian of the two great mosques. And the second piece is that he has, because he has a very extreme right-wing coalition, he has people in, the, in his coalition who basically don't believe there should ever be any kind of Palestinian state at all. They call, you know, they want a greater Israel, as they call it, from the river, the Jordan River to the sea. And that means no West Bank, no Gaza. I don't know what they plan to do with the, you know, five million Palestinians on those lands. But the, the Netanyahu government has been very, very hardline, mostly in the West Bank, you know, uh, shootings, arrests, killings, uh, the, you know, thousands of Palestinian prisoners. So, you know, you had gotten to the point where Israeli-Palestinian relations were terrible. The Palestinians are looking and seeing they're being marginalized. They're going to be bypassed, this big deal. 
And all that comes together, and the 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 Palestine Hamas must have decided we are going to, you know, burn the house down. And in doing this, what are they hoping? They're hoping they'll trigger a massive Israeli reaction, which is ongoing, that that reaction will then make the Arab world sympathize with the Palestinians who are getting pummeled. In that context, it'll be very hard for Saudi Arabia to normalize relations with, with Israel. Uh, and that, that, that serves their objectives of A, highlighting the Palestinian cause, B, putting Israel on the defensive, C, getting rid of the, the Saudi normalization. So I think that was their objective. How much of this, uh, in terms of the timing, do you think was because uh, Hamas sensed weakness and a divided Israel? I think there's probably some of it. I, would, I wouldn't exaggerate it. I think that they know that the Israelis are very strong, that in situations like this, they've come together before. Remember, is, Israel has had divided and fractious government for the last 20 years. And this is the fifth time Hamas has tried to do something like this. The One of those, uh, those wars, if you want to call it that, or military operations between Israel and, and Hamas lasted 51 days. So this is, I, I, I think that there are some people on the Israeli right who are saying, see, you know, all these demonstrations caused all this. I don't buy that at all. I think that, the, the, I would put it slightly differently, which is that the government in Israel had focused almost single-mindedly on, on, on three issues, overturning judicial independence or undermining judicial independence. That was a big constitutional push. Normalizing relations with Saudi Arabia and essentially creating de facto annexations on the ground in the West Bank to make a Palestinian state, state there more and more unviable. They might have not been paying a lot of attention to Gaza. In fact, we have some interesting Israeli reporting that says that there were army people who were telling the Netanyahu government, uh, look at what's going on in Gaza, because some of what the Hamas was doing is they were openly practicing maneuvers. And the Netanyahu government thought this was a head fake, that they were trying to sort of fool them, and they, they didn't take it very seriously. I can't vouch for this, but this is... This is being reported in uh, places like Haaretz. Uh, so I think that there may some of that dynamic may be at work, but I doubt very much uh, that it. You know, I, did 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 Osama bin Laden look and notice that you know, uh, two thousand was a fra very fractious election and the Supreme Court decided it, and that's why he went for nine eleven. I don't buy that. I think they, these guys know these you know countries are strong. What they're looking for, terrorists are always looking for the reaction. They're always trying to bait you into a massive reaction. So if one of the objectives was to put a wedge between Riyadh and Israel, it just strikes me that, and tell me if you agree with this, that it's worked. And I'm just shocked that both Riyadh and Israel um, wouldn't make some noises that, that, no, this isn't working, but it appears as if they've to a certain extent, if this was the primary objective, they've already achieved their objectives. I think, I think you're right, uh, Scott. I think that at least in the short term, you notice that they're, they're, they're being very, Riyadh is being very quiet. I'll tell you this, a, a few weeks ago, uh, a, a Saudi official explained the situation to me. And he said, and I'm paraphrasing now because it was sort of all, all off the record, but I think this is the way the Saudis are thinking about this. Look, we, we are willing to do this and we want to do this because it serves both our interests, but we have to be careful with our domestic uh, population, particularly because the crown prince has been doing a lot of stuff that has been uh, enraging the religious fundamentalists in his country. He's shut down the religious police. He's allowed you know, movie theaters, restaurants, desegregated every facility where women can be. Women can now drive. Women can leave the country without checking with their male guardians. All that stuff has pissed off the, the mullahs. He said, I, we, we can't also piss them off by completely abandoning the Palestinians. So we do need some real concessions on the Palestinian front. So he was telling me you know, that he, he, there's a feeling, particularly in, in America, in Washington, that the Saudis are, you know, completely unconcerned. They're, they're happy to sell the Palestinians down the river. They just want to make a deal with uh, Israel. Now, I think there's some truth to that. That is that they they are 
as frustrated with the Palestinian leadership as anyone who has ever dealt with the Palestinian leadership would be. Well, they're feckless, corrupt, incompetent, but they know that they've got this issue. They don't, you know, and they're, they're fairly careful about how much they push forward. You know, for example, they've been opening up all this tourism and all this, uh, these, building all these hotels. They still don't allow you to drink alcohol. And I talked to a couple of Saudi friends of mine, and, and the point is, you know, it's going to happen. But, you know, you, you push one of these things every six months. You don't push them all, all together, and you try to work with those people. So my guess, that's the dynamic here, that the Saudis are going to be very careful. But I think their national interests are driving them together. So, you know, if, as long as this doesn't completely explode, and it might, you could, you could see this getting back on track maybe in a year. So if this is a war of perception, you know, what, what was it? Lincoln said that you can't win a war without public support and you can't lose one with it. And they're trying, this is a game of perception, trying to evoke sympathy based on what they feel will be an outsized overreaction. Granted, I'm seeing everything through the lens of Western media as someone who has family in Israel, as someone who sits on the board of companies of former Israeli combat veterans who that night were on planes to Israel. So I have a bias here. But it seems to me that they have vastly miscalculated that the perception of what has gone on here will, I, I believe that empathy towards Palestine or Palest the Palestinian cause across America and the West had somewhat increased steadily over the last 20 years. And that the perception was negative or increasingly less positive towards Israel. And I feel like the actions of the last three or four days, have totally reversed that. Have I misread this situation? Uh, I, I tend to uh, to think you're right. Uh, I, I, you know, I guess I, I would say I hope you're right in the sense that I, I think this kind of brutal, savage, barbarous terrorism really has no place. You can have, you can legit, you can sympathize with the legitimate uh, grievances of Palestinians. You can sympathize with the Palestinian cause, but it seems to me nothing justifies this kind of terrorism. Mm -hmm. And the, and the barbarism with which they did it, that music festival, dragging women, raping, you know, taking children, all that I, I think will produce the kind of reaction you're describing. Now, it is worth saying, though, that that is not how it's being portrayed, particularly in the Arab world. I've taken pains to try to, you know, to the extent I can, watch uh, and, and read stuff that is uh, more available and gives you a sense of what's going on outside. In, you know, there was, there was some initial shock at just the brutality, but now increasingly what is happening, and this is what I was sort of saying, now what is happening is there is the focus on every building that's being bombed in Gaza, you know, every family that's being dispossessed, every, you know, the, the, the women and children in the rubble. And, you know, my guess is you're going to end up with a very disproportionate uh, body count at the end of all this, because right now, yeah, you have uh, 900 Israelis killed and, you know, several hundred Palestinians. But by the time the Israelis are done with this, you know, just because of the massive superior firepower of the Israelis, you're going to see the you know, Gaza will be devastated and that will probably evoke a certain amount of sympathy. Um, so I, I think remains to be seen. It partly depends on what the Israelis do. And I hope the Israelis think about that issue because, you know, they bombed Gaza a lot uh, over, over the last 20 years. It's not clear to me that that strategy works. Uh, I would think more about creating a buffer zone, you know, taking, essentially annexing a kilometer or so of land so that you make the border impregnate, impregnable. But there is this desire for understandable for revenge almost. And I, I would hope that that is kept in check. And a, there's a more strategic idea of like, what is the purpose of this operation? Yeah, I just, when I see, when I saw this, these barbaric images, I couldn't, you know, we, we spent a lot of time talking about young men on the show. And we've always, we've said consistently that the most dangerous person in the world is a young, broke, and alone man. And I, I see this imagery and I just go back to the same thing that there's too too many of these young men that have absolutely no, they have just, quite frankly, nothing to lose. And have there been any ideas or 
um, opportunities to address longer term. I mean, I don't care if it's migrants flooding the U.S. border. It it all seems to reverse engineer to an absence of opportunity across young people, which, and I, I need to say this, in no way excuses what has happened. But do you think some sort of long-term solution, what is it? Is it economic aid? Is it their own governance rights? Like, if you if you... If Israel says, we can't have this again, and we need a buffer zone, and maybe some retribution that teaches people the algebra of deterrence or a pretty difficult lesson, there's going to also have to be a long-term sort of economic solution. Because you're right, there's 5 million people we got to deal with. Have, has there been any leadership around this issue or any model for what, what we might want to implement here? So first, I want to underscore the point you're making, which is... Um you know, there are 2.2 million people in Gaza. It's the most densely populated part of the world. 50% um, of those are children. 50% of those are children. Youth unemployment in Gaza is over 60%. By some accounts, 70%. 75% um, of the people in Gaza lack access to drinking water. 60% um, live under poverty and, you know, below the poverty line. So it's a pretty miserable place. The Secretary General of the UN visited it and he described it last year as hell on earth. So, you know, it's an interesting question of how much, how much worse can you make Gaza? And again, absolutely, you know, and it's important, now I'm talking about the people of Gaza. That Hamas is a terrible, tyrannical uh, 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 terrorist organization. So it's e even worse for them to the extent they have any governance. It's, it's governance through this very tyrannical, uh, radical, and corrupt uh, organization, uh, Hamas. The problem is, uh, I think, Scott, that you put your, your, your finger on how to think about this, but what these people want more than anything else, as far as I can tell, is political rights and dignity. And the Israelis have been very willing uh, to give them a lot of other stuff, economic rights, development aid. The world has been willing to give them that. But it's almost as this, as if we're trying to kind of obfuscate or get around the central problem, which is what they want is a state. And the Israelis, to be fair, have tried to go down that path as well. Not so much this government, but Ehud Barak, you remember 2000, Bill Clinton came all tantalizingly close to a Palestinian state. They had agreed on all the parameters, both sides. And then Yasser Arafat pulls out the last minute. Uh, Ehud Omert, another Israeli prime minister, offered a version of that deal again to M Abbas, the current Palestinian Authority leader. He turned it down. So the Palestinians, I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for the Palestinians. I have, do not have a lot of sympathy for the Palestinian leadership, which has time and time again uh, just, you know, the way I would put it is fundamentally, there was a struggle here. Uh, the Israelis have won. The Israelis have won. They have, you know, that they have all the territory. They're a rich, powerful, strong country. When you're in a war that you're losing, the longer you wait, the worse the deal you get. And the Palestinians have kept. If you think about it, the deal they were offered in forty-seven, forty-eight, the partition was half of of, the, of that of that British mandate land. They said no. They, the, the Israelis take more. Then the sixty-seven war happens. The Israelis take more. Now the settlement activity is taking place. The Israelis are, so what the deal that, that uh, Clinton offered, that uh, Barack and, and Pal the Palestinians, is way better than anything they could dream of getting today. Because in a war when you're losing, the longer you wait, the worse the deal gets. And the leadership doesn't want to own up to its people that, you know, the dream of a loaf is gone. We have a half loaf. And if we keep pissing around, it's going to be 40% of the loaf, and then it'll be 30% of the loaf. And they just, you know, Palestinian leadership has a lot to, put, to, to answer for, in my view. So let's talk about second order effects. We talked about that for the time being, um, any sort of agreement between the kingdom and Israel is kind of on hold or is in stasis. What about, what does this do for U.S.-Israeli relations, U.S.-Iranian relations? What does it mean for the conflict, not the conflict, the uh, invasion of Russia, Russia's invasion of Ukraine? What are the kind of, as we get away from the blast zone here, what do you see as the long-term geopolitical impacts across Europe, Middle East, and U.S. relations with these different entities? So I, I think in the region, what you see is this, this the, the reality of a post-American Middle East. It's very messy. 
everyone is trying to gain a jockey for advantage. You're going to see more uh, violence. You're going to see more groups that try to take advantage of the fact that there is this level of instability. I think the, with the Iranians, the interesting question is how, how much do they want to, that's the crucial question here. Because the other ones, the Turks are trying to establish themselves a bit in Syria. The Israelis, of course, have largely been trying to do it through technology and, and, and that kind of thing and build up a big deterrent force. The Saudis are trying to do it with money. The Iranians have tended to try to extend their influence politically and militarily through militias in, you know, in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Syria, in Iraq. And so will the Iranians really try to play a game here? The, I think you know, everyone, the Iranians are a malicious force, don't get me wrong, but they, they seem to be searching for a way out, partly because they have these crippling sanctions on them. What, what's the evidence of this? The biggest evidence of this is the Saudi-Iranian normalization, the rapprochement. Right, that was a big, big deal. You remember it happened last year, the Chinese brokered it. That seems to me, they would jeopardize all that if they were to go uh, really take advantage of this. Uh, but that's the part I worry the most about. And then there's the broader issue, which is, look, the, the central challenge in international relations we face is a version of what's going on in the Middle East, which is, can we maintain a rules-based international order that encourages open trade, open commerce, open communication, open information platforms without the great liberal hegemon superpower that sustained, built, and paid for the international system as it exists today, the United States. Because the U.S. is not going to be able to play that role that it's played in the past, partly because it has grown weary, uh, partly because others have risen and will not accept you know, U.S. hegemony. And people, you know, states like Russia, Iran, groups like Hamas, Hezbollah, are basically trying to, in, their, in various ways, undermine the rules-based order, undermine the international system, burn the house down. Will they win? Or will, will the United States and Europe and Japan and Singapore and Saudi Arabia, all these countries that want order and stability and openness, will they prevail? That's the big dynamic, and that's why what happens in the Middle East does have a larger global significance. Uh, Ukraine, what, if any, impact does it have, have on our I don't think um, it has too much. Here. The biggest problem in Ukraine is the West is getting uh, fatigued. They, will, they won't admit it, but they are getting fatigued. You know, you're seeing signs of it in the Republican Party very strongly. Uh, you're seeing some signs in Europe as well. Slovakia election elected. They elected basically a pro-Russian leader. The Poles, uh, these populist nationalists are, you know, they're pretty good on Ukraine, but they've been quarreling with Ukraine for the last two or three months about Ukrainian aid. As these refugees, remember, there's six, seven million Ukrainian refugees living in Europe. I think that's the, the critical thing to look at. The Ukrainians are not going to give up. This is their land. This is their this is existential for them. The question is, will they run out of money and, and, and weapons? And that's all, that's all on the West. I, I have begun to feel that one, one solution to this problem might be for us to seriously take and try to do what a number of very uh, smart experts and senior, senior for, former policy officials have been saying, which is let's tap the Russian uh, uh, funds from the, that are frozen from the Russian central bank. It's about $320 billion. And we start getting that money flowing to Ukraine as reconstruction, as reparations, call it what you will, money is fungible. That both gives Ukraine a, a cushion. It also sends a signal to the Russians that, look, you, know, you can't out, outweigh us. The Russian strategy right now is pretty clear. They're waiting for the 2024 election. They think there's a 50% chance Donald Trump will win. Trump will sell the Ukrainians down the river, make cut a deal with Putin. Well, what if you had this independent mechanism set up by an independent you know, agency, you know, maybe the European Union or something like that, that is just sending this money on the basis, and as Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary, said, this is unprecedented, but so is the naked aggression that Russia took, you know, engaged in. And if the lesson, if the if the precedent you're setting is, you're see, you're you're 
foreign exchange reserves and your central bank reserves are sacrosanct unless you brutally invade your neighbor, in which case all bets are off. That's not a bad precedent to set. I want to put forward a couple of theses and you validate or nullify them. But as we pull back the lens on the Middle East, uh, I increasingly believe that the geopolitical or the catastrophic geopolitical decision of the last 50 years will be seen as our invasion of Iraq. Our weariness, the resources expended, we're like someone who's gotten their eyebrows burnt and we just don't want to get near any hot surface any longer in the Middle East. That whether it's taking out a natural buffer to Iran, uh, this this incredible vacuum that we will, in the fullness of time, look back on going too far. You know, going into Afghanistan, absolutely justification, but going into Iraq will be seen as probably the greatest geopolitical mistake uh, in U.S. history of, since you know last fifty years. Yeah, I think there's no question. It was it was. Uh, I, how would I would say this was bigger than Vietnam? I don't know, but it certainly was a massive, massive mistake, and it re- represents two things. One was this was the kind of peak American hubris. You know, this was a this was an American dominated world. This was the post Cold War world. We destroyed the world like a colossus, and then nine eleven happens, and we get we are like a wounded giant, and we start lashing out, and we lash out, and we totally militarize the conflict. You know, I wrote a, a piece for Newsweek right two weeks after nine eleven called "Why They Hate Us," and the whole I was trying to explain the roots of this kind of Islamic rage. And the main point I was trying to get across is, look, the main thing we have to understand is this is a kind of ideological, civilizational, political struggle. Don't turn it into a military struggle because that's what they want. Again, Osama bin Laden once said, you know, it's so telling that he thought about it this way. He said, if we go anywhere, if a small band of us go anywhere in the world and raise the flag of Al-Qaeda, we can be sure the American army will come thundering in. That's the goal. That's what they're trying to do, is to draw you into these places that are quagmires. Even Afghanistan, I think we, we massively misread how we should, we should handle it. We should have gone in there, got rid of the Taliban, and then left. You know, I mean, these places, when you try to bring order in a, in a country, what we always forget is we are the foreigners. And you can have all the best intentions in the world. You can... But it's the easiest thing in the world to arouse nationalist opposition against an, an occupying foreigner. You know, if we, had ta- if we had understood that, I think we would be in a much better place today. So the U.S., I think, crudely perceives the kingdom and MBS, um, poor track record on human rights, Jamal, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, and the thesis is that MBS is actually an enormous asset. Uh, or an enormous positive for the West, that the pivot from a hot war in Yemen and a cold war in Iran, sort of the pivot, loosely speaking, from terrorism to capitalism, that we could have not written a better script for pro-West interests. Your thoughts? Yeah, I basically agree, but let me preface it by saying, when I went to Saudi Arabia about 10, 12 years ago, uh, this was more than that now, 15, 16 years ago. I know this happens to you, Scott, but as you get older, you, <laughs> you forget that the thing you did that were, you thought were 10 years ago were actually 20 years ago. Uh, yeah, no, time's, time's, time is just flying by. I, I went to Saudi Arabia, and uh, Jamal Khashoggi was my, was my guide, was my Sherpa. He took me around. So we got to be very close, uh, and I admired him enormously. So I say this with that caveat. Look, at the end of the day, what he did with, on that front in, 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 in some other areas was unpardonable, unforgivable, but he has been the principal modernizing force in the Gulf on a scale we have never seen before. Saudi Arabia has modernized more in the last two to three years than it did in the previous 50. You know, even if you think about human rights, he's allowed women to drive. He's allowed them, most importantly, to be in unsegregated areas in education, in workplace. That means Saudi women, female participation in Saudi Arabia has been going up steadily, much, much faster than people realize. You are getting to the point where those distinctions are becoming much less important. He's opened up the economy to outside forces. Uh, he's opened it up to entertainment. He's opened it up to you know, tourism. All those are freedoms. You know, people have the freedom now to do lots of different things that they were not able to. They don't have political freedom yet. You can't pretend they do. But point two, as you say, 
he could be a huge Western asset because look at how he's modernizing his country. Is it along Chinese lines? No, it's along Western lines. Look at what he's, you know, he's buying. He's buying you know, golf and, and, and Formula One and, and sports, you know, and, yeah, so, and soccer. Yeah, they're, they're opening four seasons. Exactly. And they're, yeah. exactly. So we, we are sort of blowing it a little bit by not recognizing that. I think that this, the deal that, we, that, that um, the Biden people have been trying to do with the Saudis with Israel is good for the Saudi Arabia, good for America, good for uh, Israel. And understand the parts America gets. Um, Saudis would agree to consult with America on the price of oil. Saudis would agree no Chinese military facilities in their country and basically no Chinese high-end technology, you know, no Huawei. They, they, they've agreed that they would continue to price oil in dollars, no, no question of pricing it in yuan. Those are real important elements of American power. Saudi Arabia is still the swing state for the most important energy resource in the world and will be the most important energy resource in the world for the next 20 years, no question. You used a key term there, it was my next question, swing, swing state. So if you think these polls in the media, Biden versus Trump, I just, I find just totally superfluous, obnoxious, because it really doesn't matter what the U.S., 45 states have already voted. Yeah. It all comes down to a small number of people in five states. And, and then if you look globally, it strikes me that the swing voters in what looks like a bifurcation or a bipolar world where it's loosely speaking China and Russia versus the EU and the US, that the swing votes, the people who decide who wins and who loses here, come down to the kingdom and India. Your thoughts? Kingdom, India, Turkey, maybe Indonesia, but basically it's a small number of states um, I want to underscore the point you were making that people don't focus on, on enough right now, which is, I think, crazy. The most powerful man in the world is going to be elected by probably uh, 100,000 people in four states, in Georgia, Arizona, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. It's not even going to be in those states, as you know, because the cities are going to go blue, blue, the rural areas are going to go red, and it's going to be those counties. exurban yeah. counties. And you're talking maybe 50,000 people are going to determine the fate of the, I mean, of the way the war in Ukraine goes, the future of the international system, whether or not, you know, because the part that worries me the most is the Republican Party is returning to its isolationist roots. This is something people don't realize. This is a big deal for ever since World War II, the Republican Party had been taken out of that. They opposed U.S. entry into World War II. They opposed U.S. support for Britain and France, all that stuff. It was the most bitter debate in some ways of the 20th century in, in American politics. That they, go, they were going back to that. Listen to Josh Hawley. Listen to uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. Listen to Trump. And you see the Republican Party is basically saying, you know, box on everybody's house. We get out of the world. If, if you want to see serious disorder, uh, that's where I think it, it begins. If we really see a, a, a total withdrawal of America from the world. What are your cliff notes on the election or 2024 in America and where America is at economically and politically? To me, what's stunning about where we are is the mismatch between economics and, and politics. So if you look at where we are economically, Scott, um, if you were to ask yourself at any previous point in history, who dominates the world of technology and the industries of the future? In the 1970s, you'd be looking at a lot of German companies, Japanese companies, you know, and Dutch companies like Philips. You know, think about what were the hot technologies yeah. then. NEC, right. Toyota, Cars, Siemens. computer, like, consumer electronics, yeah. all that. Today, it's America, America, America. Um, 100%. You know, it's just crazy how dominant we are. Uh, our banks are absolutely dominant there there's no, no you know there are no global banks left and they're just american banks uh, the europeans are in tatters the chinese can't open up their system the japanese banks have been declining for 25 years you look at demographics we're the only rich country that is going to be demographically vibrant because we take in I'm not talking about anything illegal we take in a million legal immigrants a year that's more than the entire industrialized world put together we're energy sufficient, uh, independent. We are the now the largest producer of liquid hydrocarbons in the world. It doesn't have as much impact as people, you know, people don't think about that because we consume most of it. But we are still the largest. We, we produce more liquid hydrocarbons than uh, Saudi Arabia or Russia. You put all that together, and then you say to yourself, 
how, how do we have this totally screwed up politics where you can't pass a budget, you can't have a speaker, you can't get any kind of rational immigration reform, which is the single thing that can, you know, that could boost the American economy right now. If we had a rational immigration system where we could bring in high tech uh, uh, workers, and, and by the way, we should be bringing in people who are just, you know, I, I'm a big believer that one of the great things that, that a rich country needs is drive, is just sheer drive. And guess what? Those people trying to cross the border three times, four times at pain of death, they have drive. And we need some of them too. Uh, but you just need a system where it's, it's lawful. It's, 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 you know, it's not, it's not, you're not just rewarding people who are breaking the law and pretending then to, to require asylum. If, how can we not, how, you know, we have this great hand. How, how, how are we screwing it up? And what? So, having said that, do you think we're gonna screw it up? Do you, Do you think Trump's gonna be reelected here? You know, I'm an optimist by nature, and I'm an immigrant. I kind of chose. I I left my country and my culture and my family and came here. So I have a lot riding on that question. I hope that America will 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 survive and prevail and thrive. I think it will because I I think at the end of the day, we muddle through. Our politics is never great. But we don't kill the goose that lays, lays the golden egg. We get it right. It just takes a while, right? Yeah. Um, what do you, on the Democratic side, do you think Biden is a lock for the nomination? There's, there's, I mean, it seems like we're all kind of praying for some mythical figure to show up and be the obvious replacement for Biden. Do you think it's too late for that? It isn't too late, but it's getting there. Look, if he decides he's going to run, it's difficult to, uh, to dislodge him. He has been a successful president. He's done more in terms of legislation than any president, any Democrat since Lyndon Johnson. He's got good judgment on Ukraine, on you know the, the things like the Saudi deal. His his uh, foreign policy has been smart. And yet, the problem I think we all have at the back of our mind is he's going to be 82 years old when he starts his second term. I, I don't know. My dad lived to 85, and he was a very healthy person and. In his 80s, he started to dish. And mostly everybody I know who has been in there, who has been through this journey, 80s are different. And I just worry. And I, I think that, you know, I hope he's really thought through this because it seems to me one strategy would be to say, look, I came in to do a job. I've done it really well. I'm now leaving it to the next generation. Yeah, it's not the 82 number that really freaks me out. It's the 86 number when Marine One leaves the West Lawn for the last yeah. time. That means at 85, we're going to, I almost don't think it's fair to him. And the, the declines, at least among the people I've known in their 70s and 80s, the decline is not linear. It escalates. So you've been very generous. And when we were off mic, we were talking about your son. And I want to just pivot for a quick minute. Uh, do you just have one son? I have a son and three? two daughters. A son and two daughters, and daughters are younger or older? Younger. So my, I, my son is 24, my next one is 20. Uh, she's a girl, she's at Wellesley, and my 15-year-old is in high school in, in New York. So advice to your younger dad self? Gosh, I have a lot. I mean, to me, that, that, that has been, in many ways, the most important thing I've done in my life, and the thing I've, I think I've thought about the most and tried to do, get right the most, and to the extent that I've done it, done it okay. It's the thing I d derive the most pride from. I would say there is no such thing as quality time. You have to spend a lot of time with your kids. Yeah, it's just time. Um, Agreed. Secondly, whatever you say is irrelevant. They will follow what you do. Uh, if you tell them, you know, don't uh, don't lie, but they can they know notice you fibbing, and and you know, if you tell them live an honorable life, but you're not living an honorable life, if, if you tell them, you know, d d don't be on your phone all day, and you're on your phone all day, like it's it's it it's all about doing, it's not about telling, and preach less and practice more. Um, and the third thing I would say is, you know, don't get too proud, and don't get too too worried this will pass. In other words, when they were reading one year faster ahead of everybody else, don't boast about it because next year they'll be reading slower. <laughs> and if you're, th you know, if they're going through some strange phase, it's a phase, you know, have the perspective of knowing it's not a, it's not a snapshot. It's a movie. So Fareed, just to, just to wrap up here, I can't help but ask a question about CNN and the larger mediascape. 
Have you thought in terms of managing your own career, like how do you, uh, have you thought about how does Fried Zakaria and the content you produce, how do you skate to where the puck is headed? And how does it, is it CNN in different formats? Is it podcasts? Is it writing more books? When you manage your own distribution channels, what are you thinking? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, CNN is going through a kind of classic innovator's dilemma problem, right? Which is that it had an amazing business model. Most people don't understand how profitable the cable carriage business was. And CNN's margins on the cable carriage fees were close to 50% and was getting, I'm guessing, one and a half billion dollars of cable carriage revenue. You know, so it made sense for them to be milking that for as much as they can, but that world is going away. The, the revenue of the future is going to be in some form in streaming and digital. And can they make that transition? The guy who, who's been become, uh, been appointed CEO of CNN is amazing and just the right person for it. He's a serious grown-up. He understands exactly what I said. He did it at the New York Times brilliantly. You know, let's see, let's see whether he's able to do it. I certainly hope so. For me, the big advantage of CNN is I want a place where I can have maximum impact, not make the maximum amount of money. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love making money. But if I have to choose, I want an open platform that anyone can access versus a closed platform where you have to subscribe to me because then I'm only getting my, my groupies. I'm only getting the people who are my fans. I like the fact that I can, you know, I'm on in a place where anyone, anywhere in the world can get me. So as long as CNN can be that place, it's a great platform. There's no other global media brand like CNN in that sense. It does, it does you know, it's all over the world, 200 countries, all um, easy to access. And then I have, you know, the books and the writing. And that's another piece where I have to think about, you know, because I've written my column for the Washington Post for about 20 years. Again, is that, is that model viable? Uh, you know, the post is itself going through its own challenges. So I'm thinking about these things all the time. But for me, the goal has always been, you know, try to have the maximum impact. Because if I'm trying to, in this profession, make my goal, uh, make the most amount of money, I, I made a stupid choice. I should have become a hedge fund manager or, you know, gone into venture capital or something. Fareed Zakaria is the host of Fareed Zakaria GPS on CNN and a columnist for the Washington Post. He's also the author of four highly regarded New York Times bestselling books, including his latest, 10 Lessons for a Post-Pandemic World. He joins us from his home in New York. Fareed, I know a lot of people who are super talented. I know a lot of people who have insight on geopolitics. The thing that makes you singular is you are fearless. Uh, with the stuff you say, it's data-driven, and I get the sense you are singing and dancing on tables as if no one is watching you. And I just, I, I, I have a great deal of admiration, and you're a great role model for, for young journalists. So I really appreciate your time and your good work. Thank you, Scott. Uh Real pleasure to be on here. As I told you, uh, my 24-year-old son is going to be so, so happy that I did this because he just adores you and listens to you. He finds you wherever you are. Uh, thanks for that. I appreciate it. Stay well. Thanks, Reed.